Welcome back. Now we're going to talk about the month-long spat between CBS and Time Warner Cable. And this is a really interesting case study because it allows us to see how bargaining theory can explain this sort of breakdown between CBS and Time Warner and also explain eventually why these guys came back to the bargaining table and actually reached an agreement. So first, let's briefly review what we know about bargaining theory. We know that uncertainty can lead to bargaining breakdown. This is because both sides are really optimistic. I think I'm really strong and I think you're really weak. And because I'm really strong and you're really weak, I'm willing to have bargaining break down and for you to suffer a great deal as a result of having not reached an agreement so that you come crawling back to the bargaining table and are willing to give up more concessions and give me deeper concessions and give me more stuff. If we're both really optimistic like that, then we're unwilling to agree to a deal despite the fact that a mutually preferable deal might exist. There might actually be an agreement that both of us would prefer to having no agreement, but because we're so optimistic, we're not actually reaching one of those agreements. So something like this happens with Time Warner and CBS. So to give you some background here, if you're not from the United States, Time Warner Cable is the second largest U.S. cable provider. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with CBS. That's the number one network in the United States. More people watch CBS than any other channel in the United States. And in August 2013, Time Warner Cable stopped broadcasting CBS. And this is because of something called a retransmission fee. So in the United States, networks, that's like Fox, ABC, CBS, NBC, those are networks, they broadcast feeds over the air. So if you have an antenna, you can plug your antenna into your television and you can watch ABC, CBS, etc. using that antenna, pulling their feeds out of the air using that antenna. However, I think most people in the United States, I'm not actually sure about what the numbers are, a lot of people, probably most people in the United States, receive all of their TV via cable. They're not actually using these antennas, they're using cables through cable companies like Time Warner Cable or Comcast Cable or Cox Cable. They're using these cables to actually receive all of their television, including not just the cable channels like ESPN, Nickelodeon, Disney Channel, but also the broadcast channels like ABC, CBS. So when these feeds are coming not through over the air, but rather through the cable company like Time Warner, these things aren't free anymore. So the U.S. networks are free to get with an antenna, but not free when they come in through the cable. When they come in through the cable, ABC, CBS, and so forth charge what's called a retransmission fee for the cable companies to use these feeds through the cables, right? So the networks are charging some money to the cable company for transmitting their feed through the cable rather than through the antenna. Now, in August 2013, CBS's deal with Time Warner for that retransmission fee was ending. This is something that the parties agree on, right? So CBS and Time Warner Cable agree on some amount to pay, uh, the Time Warner Cable will pay CBS to retransmit. And their previous agreement was coming to an end. CBS reportedly wanted to increase that retransmission fee from less than $1 to $2. We don't exactly have exact details here about what was going on with CBS and Time Warner, so we're having to do some sort of speculation. We actually have a pretty good idea that it was less than $1 before and $2 afterward from leaked media reports, but that's essentially what we have to base this sort of information on. We don't have facts because these, these conversations were private, the bargaining was private, but we have some sort of idea what was going on based out of leaks from the media. So CBS CBS really wanted to increase the retransmission fee substantially, more than double it, and Time Warner just said, no, we're not doing that. Okay, so that is the situation between Time Warner and CBS. And to delve back into bargaining theory a little bit, something that we haven't covered before, if we're really interested in explaining why bargaining breaks down and then gets resolved, we're essentially looking for what's called a complete and coherent explanation for bargaining breakdown. And a complete and coherent explanation has three qualities. First, it explains why bargaining failed initially. So imagine bargaining fails today, right? Well, if bargaining is failing today, despite the fact that there are these mutually preferable settlements that leave both of us better off than if bargaining fails, we need to have an explanation for why we don't actually reach one of those agreements. So that's step one. Step two is when we actually resolve this sort of bargaining situation, perhaps a week from now, we have to explain why we're actually now willing to sit down and bargain. Right? So we need to explain why bargaining fails today and also why bargaining gets resolved later. And to make this all coherent, we need to make sure that whatever our explanation is for what's resolving the bargaining problem later on is also solving the problem from step one. Right? If bargaining is breaking down because of A today and A is still present in the future, we need to actually explain why they're able to resolve the bargaining problem despite the fact that A is there. So either A is still there or it's gone. 
And if it's gone, then we understand why bargaining is now getting resolved. If it's not gone, we need to actually introduce something else that explains this to make this all a complete and coherent explanation. And we're going to see this just with information here with Time Warner Cable versus CBS. So let's explain why bargaining broke down in the first place. I'm going to look at CBS's side first. Now, I'm very pessimistic about CBS here. This is not exactly going to be a neutral explanation of what was going on between CBS and Time Warner, because if you study this, it really becomes clear, at least from my perspective, perhaps your mileage may vary, that CBS wasn't really on the up and up here, and we're trying to essentially uh, hoodwink the customers into uh, being okay with a higher retransmission fee. So CBS thought that Time Warner would actually pay this $2 retransmission fee uh, that they were asking for. So I mentioned this before, CBS is in fact the number one network, right? So CBS, you know, hey, look, we're really awesome. Of course, you should be paying us a lot of money for retransmission fees. So that's that's a good point that CBS was making. But these other two points are going to get a little a little bit sketchier and then very sketchy. So the first point that Time Warner, or rather that CBS was making when they went public with the spat is that they were pointing out that cable channels get a heck of a lot more money than the broadcast networks in these fees. So cable channels, for example, like ESPN, ESPN gets the highest payment of any sort of cable fee. ESPN's per month cable fee is $6. So if you own, or rather if you're a subscriber to any sort of cable company, you're paying $6 a month to have ESPN. If you didn't know that, perhaps that's a surprise, but yes, you are actually paying $6 a month to get ESPN. These Cable channels, a lot more money. ESPN is a higher uh, higher mark, but a lot of other channels like USA, TNT are getting really high fees as well. And so CBS is looking, is saying, look, you know, we're we're more watched than any of these other channels, yet they're getting more from the the cable company, or the cable company is is paying them more. Why aren't we getting paid a lot too? Now, the reason I say that this is a little bit sketchy here is because if you're paying two dollars per month to watch CBS, then if you bought a fifteen dollar antenna then you would get that money back in what? That's like seven and a half months that would pay for the antenna. So CBS here is not actually getting paid for the subscription to the network, right? You're actually just paying for the retransmission because you can get CBS over the air. So that was the other point that CBS was trying to make. And the third point is that they kind of suspected that customers would not realize they'd ultimately had to pay the fee because CBS is saying, look, we're not charging you as the customer. We're charging Time Warner, right? So get mad at Time Warner if Time Warner isn't willing to pay it. We're just asking Time Warner to pay us a little bit more for the retransmission fee. So that was CBS's side of things. Time Warner's side. And let me just say this. I'm a Time Warner customer. Time Warner really sucks. I do not like Time Warner whatsoever. I am not a Time Warner apologist, but I, I do think that in the spat between CBS and Time Warner, Time Warner was actually the good guy. Um, so Time Warner thought that customers wouldn't pay $2. And part of this is because of that antenna thing that I was talking to you about. Uh, they actually told their customers, look, if you really want your CBS, then you should just go buy a $15 antenna and you can get it for free. You don't need us to do this. You don't need us to, to pay $2 a month for you to watch CBS. You can just use that antenna. And that's actually what I do. I have a $15 antenna that does all that for me. Uh, the other point that Time Warner was making is that CBS.com has all of the shows. So if you really want to watch CBS, you don't have to pay the $2 retransmission fee. You can just go on to CBS.com and you can watch the shows, even if you don't even have a TV. And the third thing that they pointed out to customers is that it would ultimately cause Time Warner to increase prices, right? Time Warner is just the middleman. Time Warner takes a bunch of cable channels and network television channels and puts them into a package, which people then buy, right? Time Warner isn't actually creating stuff on their own. They're just creating, or they're just acting as the middleman to get customers their television. And so Time Warner is saying, look, if we do get this, this free transmission fee increased to $2, we're not going to be the ones paying it. It's going to be our customers paying it. So we're not going to do this because we we don't want to raise prices on our customers. And so given these two differences of opinions, right, Time Warner thinks that they're in the right, CBS thinks that they're going to get away with this. This is what leads to bargaining breakdown. But over the course of the month, the bargaining problem resolves itself, right? So CBS spent and Time Warner spent about a month educating customers. The, the breakdown of bargaining lasted from basically all of August to a few days into September. And during that time, there were a ton of news stories explaining what was going on. There were commercials, both CBS and Time Warner were purchasing commercial space to explain to customers why this is going down, giving both the customers their side of the story, CBS giving their side, Time Warner giving their side. And you know something that's really interesting, if you actually lived in a place where you had Time Warner, I lived in Los Angeles, or I was in Los Angeles at the time this was going on, if you turned onto a channel that was blacked out, it wouldn't just be a black screen. Time Warner was really clever, they instead put a 
essentially a propaganda message on the screen instead explaining in like a slide why they are refusing to uh to pay the cbs retransmission fee and and that they're essentially standing up for the consumer and that's why this this channel is blacked out and it sucks for all of us but that's why we're doing it so that was what Time Warner was doing with their blackout. And what you can see here is over the course of the month, if the reason for the breakdown in bargaining was because both sides thought that customers would end up on their side, CBS thinking that they'll get the customers on their side because customers really want to be able to watch CBS, and Time Warner thinking customers will go on their side because, hey, they don't want to pay two extra dollars for the retransmission of CBS. Both of those sides thought that they were on the winning side. Over time, over that month, you actually find out what's going on right? The difference in opinion is going to disappear over that month. Both sides can poll customers and see what they think of this sort of situation, if they think CBS is in the right, or if they think Time Warner is in the right. And by doing that, you actually learn whether you're correct or whether you're not, and whether you're suffering or the other side is suffering. And so with that month-long period in place, both sides realized who was in the right and who was in the wrong, and that allows a deal to become possible. And so that's why we see Time Warner and CBS actually coming to an agreement. It's because before they had a disagreement about what was going on, after that month-long period where no CBS was being broadcast to Time Warner, uh, Time Warner Cable customers, well, the information is no longer uncertain. Everybody knows what's going on, and they have a much clearer picture that allows them to sit down at the bargaining table and hammer out an agreement, which is what happens in September of 2013. So I hope you thought this was an interesting application of bargaining theory, and I think it is. I think it actually gives you a good narrative about what's going on with CBS and Time Warner, which might not be clear if you're someone who's unfamiliar with bargaining theory. So that's that. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you next time. Take care.